My name is Mother Mary Taylor. I am a religious of the Sacred Heart in Florence. We have our convent there, which is also our mother house. I'm originally from the United States of America, but I entered our order directly in Florence and have been there for almost 25 years. I came to know about our community in Florence during the year that I was studying with Franciscan University in Austria. I was in Gaumen, Austria, and there through a priest I later visited and was interested in the order. So my name is Mother Annie and I went to the University of Dallas. I studied art history and then it was actually painting that took me to Florence. It was there that I was connected through Bishop Conley to the Religious of the Sacred Heart in Florence and well I went to study and I stayed. <laughs> I'm Mother Therese. Um, Dodge and I'm from Manassas, Virginia originally and uh, I came to the order in Florence, Italy about 12 years ago. I was studying at Christendom College and the Christendom College has a program where we study abroad in Rome and during that semester I went to Lourdes, France and at Lourdes I received a special grace among many graces as I had been very ill for a long time. And I had come to the acceptance of my physical handicaps, but the mental darkness, the spiritual darkness, which I experienced during that time was overwhelming. And that was the cure that I asked of Our Lady when I went to Lourdes, a cure which I received. And I not only received that cure, but I also received my religious vocation there at Lourdes and when I went back to Rome it was only confirmed. I waited for a while to see if I was just on a spiritual high but it endured and when I went back to campus and finished my studies at Christendom it just got stronger and stronger in me and I knew that was where God was calling me. He, he wanted my whole heart and so then when I went to work in Florence, Italy I was definitely working in a convent environment for the purpose of further discernment. And then I remained there in Florence. Our order was originally founded in 1800 by St. Madeleine Sophie Barat. She began the order in France after the French Revolution, a time period in which especially um, the upper class women were without education. And so this was a time in which France really needed to be reconstructed. And so she took on this mission to glorify the heart of Jesus through educating, especially at the time period, women. And eventually the order grew, came to the United States through the missionary work of St. Rose Philippine Duchenne in 1818. And at the time of Mother Barat's death in 1865, there were 120 houses of the Sacred Heart. In Florence, our small community lives, and we are a reformed community, trying to stay faithful to the original charism. We have a very strong spiritual life, or a semi-cloistered order, so that means that we don't go out unless there is a need to. It is more so a cloister that has to do with one's heart, and so it's a matter of giving the priority of our affection, of our attention, of our mind to our Lord, because in the end, this relationship with our bridegroom is the priority of our lives. Whether we are teaching, whether we are praying, whether we're working, this is obviously the most important aspect of our lives. The Sacred Heart has almost a, a history of glory, <laughs> a history of living saints. And it is really humbling in the most beautiful of ways to be called to be part of that. We say that we are missionaries and we are missionaries because Italy is a missionary territory. Because it is a territory of apathy, but better the challenge, no? <laughs> we must give our all till it hurts, as Mother Teresa of Calcutta always said, no? Where can you best see this example? It's Christ on the cross. But it isn't Christ on the cross who is 
sad and gloomy. In Florence, there's the beautiful museum of San Marco, where you see in almost every cell a crucifixion of Christ almost smiling on the cross, looking down at his open side. It's Christ who is given to the last drop. Even after it seemed like it was the end, he wanted his heart to be open wide. His love was bursting even after death to say, how can I give you more and more and more? And this is what the gift of the Sacred Heart is. It is the sacrament of love. It is Jesus in the Eucharist, his real presence given to us daily in Holy Communion so that we, with Christ in our hearts, can then irradiate this message of love and of mercy to all of our kids and from our kids all the world. We religious are like the monstrance, that gold purified that is clinging to him and glorifying him, the glory of God, which we are called to irradiate. We are called to live and we live it in the day to day, in what seems like such a simple life of contemplation and education. What a nice little vocation. No, it's extreme. It, it is giving to the last drop. The specific charism of our order is that of the glory of the heart of Jesus, whereas most religious orders, the goal of their order is that of the sanctity of their own members. Um, for us, the calling is a little more demanding in that our charism is such that our sanctity becomes a means. In order to glorify the heart of Jesus, we need to be saints and not only our sanctity but then our apostolate of education of the youth are the two primary means of bringing about the glory of the heart of Jesus. This makes our sanctity something that needs to be a reality in our lives so that the heart of Jesus is glorified in our lives and then we try through education of the youth to raise up souls that will then also follow in this same charism, usually in their own walks of life. We have four vows, obedience, chastity, poverty, and a fourth vow, the education of the youth. So as of right now, we have about 370 students. This ranges from two and a half year olds to the end of Liceo or high school, 18, 19 years old. We have three possibilities of concentrations in our high school. There's a linguistic studies, there's a scientific studies, and there's classical studies. Our Holy Mother Foundress insisted that we had an excellence of education. All education was a means to open the heart and a means to open one's mind this is what we want to bring our children to. Not a closed-minded, secular world where your face is stuck to your telephone because you're Twittering and Instagramming and, and WhatsApping every second. No, there is a whole adventure. This is the end of our education, to become adorers of the Sacred Heart. The end is to open up not only my heart, but the heart of everyone around us, to enter into that interior depth to enter into the infinite confines of his heart. It is a great adventure. Our Holy Mother Foundress uses three principal titles to describe the religious of the Sacred Heart, which are reiterated over and over in our constitutions and in her conferences that she's given to her spiritual daughters. She calls the religious of the Sacred Heart, spouses of the Sacred Heart of Christ, mothers, which is the title that we still use today, mothers, and victims. Those three titles are very interrelated. Being spouses, we must be united to the heart of Christ and we must be fruitful. That union is a union of complete devotion. Our every thought, our every word, our every action, all of our sentiments, the very beating of our heart must be in union with the heartbeat of our Lord. There is nothing that can separate us. And most importantly, we see that in our will. And that brings us to the aspect of victim. It is not a victim in the sense of self-mutilation or extreme penances. That is not what he is asking of his spouses. Victim must be interpreted in the sense of a complete holocaust, 
a holocaust that does not hold back anything, but a holocaust of the will. Our will must be united completely with the will of our spouse in everything we do, in that which is hard and which costs us, and the things that we would like to do. If we are united completely with our spouse, everything is burned in this sacred holocaust. And in the holocaust, we see fire. Fire is a source of light, so we give light to the world. It is a source of warmth. We must warm and give that heat to the souls that come in contact with us. And it also consumes the fuel, and we are the fuel that must be consumed in this fire. We are the religious of the Sacred Heart. What is our day like? Well, we have many particular duties, but moments that could mark our day would be 5.10 in the morning. We have Office of Readings, followed by an hour of meditation, followed by Louds, followed by the Mass. Then we have all sorts of things, ranging from class to the farm to the borders to any array of things. We then will meet back together at noon for a noonday prayer, followed by lunch, which is half in silence, listening to a lecture, often the Pope's latest exhortation. Then again, we're back to our particular duties. We meet together again at five o'clock. We have a half an hour of adoration, followed by Vespers, followed by a half an hour of recreation and community. Within our day, we will have also made sure to take time for praying the Most Holy Rosary, also a half hour of spiritual reading. Then we'll meet again at 7.30 for dinner, then again at 8.30 after other duties for Compline. After Compline, we have grand silence. You're there still and always immersed in the heart of Jesus. Well, it's all for the heart of Jesus. It's all for and with Jesus. So. When that alarm clock rings at about a quarter to five, you just hit the ground and kiss it, <laughs> giving him and entrusting him everything of that day. Because as soon as you hit that four, you're going to be running. <laughs> it's all essentially a contemplative work. Even in our busiest moments, for our Holy Mother Foundress, St. Madeline Sophie Barat, without our interior life, our whole charism crumbles. This rings true. Even in our busiest day, if our core of our day is not rooted in the heart of Christ and in our interior silence, it's a day wasted. Our motto is cor unum et anima una. We are called to live of one heart, of one soul. Community is essential for us. When we talk about superiors, our Mother Superior right now, Mother Olympia, doesn't like the word. She loves the word, however, mother, that she is the mother. And this is essential. She herself has given up everything, right? She's from the Gucci empire, <laughs> if you will. But it's beautiful because each one in the community is living now under her maternal mantle. And it's so beautiful. It is such an honor and a gift to live and breathe the presence of these women because you can see how their one great desire is to become a living, breathing saint. They want each moment to be grace working through them. And you can see it just in that little moment of self-control, in that little extra smile. Every little moment goes back to the same spirit that our Holy Mother Foundress and the few who were with her in 1800 in Paris when they decided that they wanted their underlying spirit to be that of generosity. In all your grumpiness and sleepiness and every challenge of your day, you see them moving through and with grace and you think, well, I can do it too because we're doing it together and we're a team. Together, we do something beautiful for Jesus. I think it's very important that young Catholic girls all think about discerning. It's an obligation for each young woman to ask our Lord what is her calling to sanctity because in the end that is what we are made for is to be able to get to heaven and to become saints. And so choosing and understanding what our Lord's choice is for us invites us also to not only holiness but happiness. Not wanting a family 
or not wanting religious life is something that shouldn't really be part of one's life because you should be attracted to having a family. You should be attracted also to wanting religious life. But it's a matter of giving our Lord that priority so that he can then guide each soul so that they know what their specific calling is, what their special way to holiness is. I think that one of the important aspects when one is looking at a community is the idea of also feeling at home and the difference also in discerning between marriage or religious life is also although marriage obviously brings great love obviously great satisfaction sometimes one's heart can say well that's not enough so it's that love that goes beyond uh, what is earthly it goes beyond and what is in the end what will be one's love with our lord in heaven and so religious life does present that eschatological reality of living already what each soul will live in heaven that is that special relationship between a person and jesus if that is your calling and i think every person should look and ask is that my calling does god want me to give him my whole heart. And I think if a person is able to be silent and listen, that that's very important to be able to choose that vocation. And even if that is the case, also to choose the vocation of marriage, but that it, it is a choice. And I think that that's an important element in any calling of life. For someone who's discerning, it's important to pray to the Holy Spirit, to ask for guidance, to be very open with our Lord in prayer, be very honest as well, whether that means fears or dreams or hopes. And then also to ask, to visit convents and to find out what I feel most at home with. To not be afraid to ask questions, to write to convents, to visit and, and to see what could be the possible answers to the yearning in my own heart so that I am able to answer that call if that is what our Lord asks of me.